All right, Duncan, we just completed our second e-summit of the year, Foresight from 2020, and the attendance exceeded our expectations. So uh, we had asked all of our participants to submit questions directly to you around any of the topics that were being presented or really anything that was on their mind. So the response was a bit overwhelming, but we were able to cut down the list to about 20 or so questions that really represent the majority of the questions asked. So um, yeah, without further ado, let's just jump right in. Yeah, and first of all, a great idea, uh, Tyler, in terms of uh, inviting the questions from our community. As you know, that's my favorite part of the job. It doesn't even feel like work when we engage and interact with uh, fee-for-service professionals and you start to see the commonalities in terms of uh, the aspirations and concerns and questions that these professionals have. So uh, I like what you've done in terms of um, distilling it down to uh, a key 20. And uh, with that, let's just make this uh, as valuable as possible. So uh, take it away. All right, sounds good. Well, the first question, Duncan, in regards to virtual education events, what types and kinds of events should we be considering given our environment? Yeah, okay. So first of all, I would like to think that in-person events are going to come back. So don't think that this is forever, the, the digital virtual deliverables. But the takeaway is that it, uh, it is a supplement to the overall client experience. And what I really like about the, the digital is uh, as part of the service matrix, this can be delivered uh, one to many to the 80% of the clients who generate 20% of the business and can engage other service providers to bring in their clients as well. They're also evergreen, which means they can be archived and part of the overarching uh, intellectual property that the uh, enterprise has. Thematically, we want our clients to be panoramic. So you go back to form, the education events shouldn't just be about money because remember something, many of your clients, they hire you to make all that go away. They don't need to know everything you know. Um, there are some that like to get into the minutia, but just balance the events based on form. Do events around continuity, secession, and family investment legacy. Do events around the concept of the work optional lifestyle and finding balance around uh, occupational pursuits. Uh, do events around recreational interests. And of course, do events and invite guest speakers to talk about all things money. Uh, so again, that's what I would say there, but the, the live events will come back, I'm sure of that. And uh, I think there's always a, just an incredible energy of assembling uh, a group of people. And I guess the, the thing to consider on the live events when that is back in our reality is keep them small, keep them in, intimate and go up market. All right, Duncan, uh, question number two, what are some of the best ideas for client engagement in this new environment? Again, uh, this is 101 stuff, but the perfect combination or balance of high tech, high touch. So strategy and tactical meetings through digital platforms are great, but supplement that with things they can hold in their hands, uh, cards, gifts, uh, books, thoughtful uh, reactions to critical life events, moments of truth, and then client facing proactive or reactive service uh, models to set expectations. This is what you can expect because one of the big parts of decommoditizing one's value is not only future pacing, right? So talking about where it's all going, getting out of the short-term rehash or fixation on uh, short-term decisions based on volatility and external dependencies, but also things that aren't promissory on performance and outcomes of your technical ability. You want them to get really bought into what's promissory around being your client over the lifetime of the relationship and into the next generation. So the net net 
proactive and reactive service that's consistent and client-facing, high-tech, high-touch balance with a, a planning forward view, future pacing. That's what I would say would be the the silver lining of all of this as it relates to service. All right, moving on, Duncan. Uh, what is the most important thing we should be doing with our clients during these uncertain times? It's got to be communication. Uh, you go right back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, your clients, they want to know what they belong to. They want to know it's going to be okay. They want to know that their ambitions are realistic and they're on a trajectory to achieve them uh, because it gives them a sense of esteem and the likelihood of achieving self-actualization. So you're competing with a lot of noise. Have proactive, reactive, scheduled and spontaneous communication. So a scheduled call rotation. Scheduled strategy and tactical meetings. Tell your clients, this is your day. And then surprise them with touches that they weren't expecting to bring them back. It's like a little mid-course correction brings them back close to the fire. So again, they have that sense of belonging and a sense that they can tune out the noise and focus on the fact that you're in control. All right, number four, how do we communicate focus and keep our clients on track when fear overwhelms? Yeah, I use the analogy of the noise canceling headphones and the signal to noise ratio. Your clients are bombarded with uh, so much information and solicitation. For those of you who really understand our philosophy and our process, you've seen our Venn diagram around what matters and what you can control with form and the three Ps. Uh, just stick to the message. So the concept of imprinting, like you become so familiar with your messaging, but there's big gaps between when your client is exposed to your messaging. So just come back to sort of true north. You don't drift or deviate from what it is that matters to your clients and what it is you can control. And the whole metaphor of it's not the wind, it's the set of the sails. It's so natural for somebody to focus on things that are out of con their control. And fear is obviously stoked in the media and is obviously quite dramatic and topical. You've got to help them just forget about the wind focus on the set of the sale. And the set of your sale is your philosophy, your planning strategy, and your process. Just keep imprinting that continuously. All right, Duncan, this next one is one of my favorite questions. How do you let long-term clients go when they think they will work well with you, but at the same time will not utilize your advice or respond in a timely manner? Yeah, so... The first thing is you give yourself permission to evolve and to grow. Not everybody else has that same mindset. Some people have kind of reached a plateau and uh, some relationships come to an end. Uh, the big distinction is it's not about firing clients. We always give them the benefit of the doubt Maybe you'll automate the relationship. Maybe you'll allocate them to somebody else. But maybe it, disassociation needs to happen. But it's always done respectfully. You're taking the high road. And you uh, basically resign yourself to this simple fact. You're doing them a disservice by keeping them. If they're not going to take your advice and follow your process, and if their philosophy is not aligned with yours, then introduce them to somebody whose philosophy is aligned and whose advice they will take. And uh, just remember that if you get too big, the service of one can come at the expense of another or can come at the expense of yourself. 
So know your capacity, know who you're suited for, and have unwavering consistency and congruency that you've earned the right to only work with clients who are a good fit based on AAA. The alignment of interests of their needs now and in the future, the attitudinal compatibility, and the mindset of advocacy. Yeah, great answer, Duncan. And uh, we also have many resources in regards to right sizing on uh, scripting and uh, disassociation letters, uh, everything you need um, in case you have to go through that that right sizing process. Well, and if I could just add to that, if if, uh, you're listening in and you attended our Foresight from 2020 Summit, you know about the dynamic, the counterintuitive dynamic of growing down your business to grow up market. It's fascinating. And I've, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've seen the jolts and some of the most significant professionals in the business were launched to another level during those intense periods of volatility because they took action, grew down the number of relationships they were managing, grew up market in terms of the sophistication and complexity of needs that their ideal client had. And with that, the amount of money they were managing increased dramatically. All right. The next question, the next question here is related. Um, The best way to end a relationship with a client in a small town. Gradually (laughs) and professionally. Uh, small towns, some people are noisy. Yeah, I get it. Um, but again, you're allowed to evolve. And if you use the context of time, the past, the present, and the future, you can rationalize and say, look, you know, when I, when I got into this business, I would work with anybody. I tried to be all things to all people. And I love what I do. And that served me well. But then I came to this realization, I've got 24 hours in the day. And you can actually get to a point of diminishing returns if you have too many relationships. So looking down the road, I've made the decision to be all things to some people. And my ideal client has an array of needs now and in the future and a level of compatibility and an alignment of interests. And I'm really going to focus there. So I just don't think we're a good fit. However, I've made uh, some connections with other professionals where I think the alignment for you is better. And I'm more than happy to make that introduction. But um, yeah, you got to approach that very methodically and gradually to cushion because ultimately... (laughs) Ultimately, what you're saying is it's it's not me, it's you. (laughs) but uh, you want to be very respectful. All right, question number seven. How often are the best teams you work with contacting their clients? What is the mix of client contacts, email, phone, in person, that type of thing? Yeah, so that's where a service matrix becomes invaluable. And again, that's client facing. You know my analogy of the open kitchen. Like everything you create, it's for everyone to to see. Nothing is held back behind the door or behind the curtain. But the service matrix, which is the level of service that's tied to the classification of the client. Um, and, you know, we, we move well beyond, as you know, Tyler, the ABCD or the gold, silver, bronze client. It's much more... Uh, in depth and with breadth now, uh, panoramic based on AAA. But <clears throat> it goes a little bit further than that beyond 80-20. I mean, we often say, right, invest 80% of your time on the 20% of the clients who generate 80% of the business. Well, to go further, we've got those three addressable audiences. You've got the people who deserve you, the people who need you, and that movable middle. The people who need you are, 
lovely people, but they're probably not going to become an ideal client. So we need to have a level of service that's tied to that expectation. The movable middle, they're tracking in a direction. Eventually, they could become a AAA client. So we're going to provide a level of service there. But for the most deserving, the A's and double A's and triple A's, they get the kitchen sink. So what does that ultimately look like? Well, it's not uncommon for one of our clients to touch a triple A client 35 to 40 times a year, proactively, reactively, virtually, or tangibly in a 12 month period of time. And it's laid out where when the onboard happens, the team member says, this is what you can expect from us. This is what it looks like to be our client. Four scheduled strategy and tactical meetings. Uh, scheduled call rotation to touch base. Uh, the bat line, of course, if anything's on your mind. And then on it goes, just a complete layout of service. And the positioning of engaging <clears throat> there are other service providers into your process. So the deserve 35 to 40, the movable middle 20 to 30, the need five to 10 and sometimes 15, depending on your capacity, but have it fully defined out of your head and make a client facing. Make sure the movable middle knows where it's going and let them aspire to becoming the most deserving client. Yeah. All right. Number eight, how to deal with client relationships who say they're willing to make introductions, but really don't. Willing. Hmm. Well, the first thing I would ask that person to do, and I'm talking to the advisor, the professional, is detach themselves from any expectation. I mean, willing to make an introduction is intent, but there's a, there's a gap, there's an interlude between intent and consent. And I know that can be frustrating. So just check out, like just forget about intent, consent, expectation, and just immerse yourself in the activity of positioning the concept of an introduction as a service you're providing. So keep imprinting that and reminding your clients. And then use some social proof. Tell some stories. Like when a client says to you, how's it going? Just say, life is great. I love what I do. And uh, every now and again... You know, we get a little reminder about how great this all is and then just talk about a great client who introduced their sister or their business partner or an accountant that introduced a client to you who's getting ready to sell their business and just, just talk about your sense of purpose. Talk about your why and just make sure there's no pitching. There's no pitching the idea of a referral as a favor you're asking of someone, right? Who else do you know? I get paid in three ways. I'm trying to grow my business. It just looks so needy. And uh, so anyway, focus on the activity, position it as a service, use social proof by telling stories that are actually authentic, and just remind yourself of the stage of readiness, right? Classic Confucius, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. It just takes time. Let that just work its magic. All right. All right, here's an interesting one, Duncan. How to position for those of us with two separate branches of our business? So there's like an investment side versus an insurance side. I think those should be fully converged into the process. Like you're, you're not an investment manager. Investment management is commoditized. Investment management is part of your process. You're not an insurance broker. You don't sell insurance solutions, but risk management is part of your process. 
if risk management and wealth management are not hand in glove, it's flawed. They can't operate in silos. So I would converge them under an overarching process as proprietary to you. That's the keystone of the relationship. Even if you get into group, uh, 401k, whatever the case may be, uh, it might not all be relevant to a specific client, but they need to know that these are all pieces of the puzzle, part of your process that you will put together for a client uh, when that need presents itself. So I don't think they should be siloed because then they become transactional. It becomes about price. It becomes about individual products and performance. I think your client needs to understand that you have a team of great people. You create a client experience because of a great practice and you have a process that puts it all together as their life unfolds and their needs evolve. All right. Great answer. All right. Number 10, about halfway through in the onboarding stage, what is an ideal balance between time spent on values, goals, and strategy? Yeah, super question. And ultimately you're led by the client because clients are different, right? You can have a left brain, you can have a right brain. Uh, So you're led by them. Uh, But balance is the operative word. And I just go back to form. I mean, Conversations around money and strategy and planning, I mean, it's clearly essential. It's your core competency, but it's still commoditized and it's still a means to an end. So be governed by form and remind your clients that the goal is not just financial independence in and of itself because of what that is. It's what that does. It's a means to an end to all the aspirations they have, the qualitative aspirations around their family, occupation, recreation. So shape every conversation around form, be led by the client in terms of what they respond to. And uh, you don't need to data dump everything you need to know or everything that you know, rather, about uh, your technical ability. Uh, The old chestnut is, I'm not trying to impress you with what I know. I'm trying to impress upon you that I know what you care about and I can connect the how with that why. Okay, as, as, as simplistic and trite as that might sound. Okay, so I'm not trying to dumb down or suppress your core competency. I just want you to be reminded that that's commoditized and they can get that somewhere else. What are the things they can't get? Somewhere else, it's your ability to integrate the why with the how framed in form. All right, that's great, Duncan. And this next question is a bit connected. So in regards to form, what is your approach on building a relationship with a type A person who really blows through FOR and wants to get to the M, the money question? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, every client we work with, as you know, Tyler, they they live by the rules they set. Mm -hmm. Okay, we give them parameters, we give them suggestions around our philosophy and our process. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they're going to do what they are inclined to do. But here's the thing. uh, Not everybody's a good fit. And how you start a relationship Like, I want you to professionalize and standardize everything. And if a client indicates that they're really not interested in the sort of warm and fuzzy, as some would call it, or that qualitative around family, occupation, recreation, you can embrace that and say, you know, we're going to get to the nuts and bolts. We're going to get to the technical. But part of my process is to understand where it's all going and why this is important to you. So just indulge me here. I'll be brief but I just want to get this captured because it's a part of our process. So you're kind of using a good cop, bad cop, and you're blaming the process because you want it to reveal something about what motivates them. Because if you uh, deviate, then you're running the risk of embracing uh, a potential relationship with a client who's constantly asking you to sharpen their pencil constantly micromanaging, constantly questioning questioning on 
performance of the past and then of course decisions into the future uh you know <laughs> it's like i say to my kids i mean the monkeys don't run the zoo i mean <laughs> i don't have all the answers as a parent but I, I am running the show don't misinterpret any of that but you live by the rules you set be process driven professionalize and standardize everything and be diplomatic but just blame the process and see what it reveals. <laughs>